Hej och hjärtligt välkomna till 942 i Heidegger-serien och det är en ovanligt solig och vacker dag i här idag. Uh, welcome to 942. This should be taken in English as usual. Sorry about the Swedish intervention. Today I would like to continue with the most wondrously interesting book by Susie Froebel. And it's very helpful to get into the book by these lectures because it's almost it's not easy to access directly as it is. It's a bit too complicated. As I was mentioning two lectures ago in 939, uh, there is a way of training one's senses by using a walking stick. How odd this might seem, it's incredibly effective though. We expand our area of intervention and expansion also into the outer surfaces of our reality. It is fair to say that the Ventruvian man by Leonardo da Vinci is our body domain. This far our senses stretches. And we know today that the idea of a body that ends with the skin is a mere illusion. It is a Western illusion, but it doesn't have any reality to it. Our body map is actually constructs that we use to move about and do things. They are not static things. We can feel pain all the way out to where I stretch my arm. That is the area of circumference, where we have accessibility and we have even nerve endings going that far, because they are projected outside. This is an example I've taken many times before and it's well worth repeating. It is the rubber hand illusion constructed by Botvinnik and Cohen. And there the guinea pigs or uh, the participants had to place one hand on the table in front of them and the other one underneath the table. Then a fake hand was put in the position where the hidden hand would have been resting on the table. The participants were asked to look at the fake hand while both that hand and the out of sight real hand were stroked with a brush. But after a while only the fake hand was being stroked. while the real, real hand was no longer being touched at all. Still, participants reported feeling the same brushing sensation on the real hidden hand, while they observed the fake one being stroked. Such distortions in proprioception, be it in the shape of reductions or extensions of the observer sphere of influence may be interpreted as boundary shifts. The rubber in illu hand illusion is an example of a fast yet ephemeral assignment of a part of our environment to our bodies. It only takes a few minutes to evoke the illusion that the rubber hand belongs to the body but it is maintained through visual feedback only for a short while. It needs yet more feedback to be persistently believed or felt because the feeling is real. The actual feeling is undiscernible from real feeling. And we need to remember that perception is always projected out of the body. It is not something coming into the body. If you feel that your world is coming to you, then you are already in the passive situation. And it's not until you train yourself 
to be otherwise, which would take at least nine months, that you would believe, uh, believe perceive, and feel something different. Such distortions, one could call in proprioception, are not really resortions, but it could be the shape of reductions or extensions of the observer's sphere of influence. These could also be called boundary shifts. The failure to perceive a hemisphere of visual space shifts the boundary between the observer and the rest of the world, which I shall henceforth refer to a world observer boundary. Towards the inside, we may say the, that the observer's extension is reduced. By contrast, the rubber hand illusion shifts the boundary outwards when for a short time a new systemic whole, human being plus fake hand, comes into being. Besides spatial observer extension and those portrayed above, there are also temporal ones. They manifest themselves in nested rhythms both with the body and in the environment. In chapter 2 I briefly introduced the idea of nested rhythms in the shape of neural oscillations, which are nested into slower metabolic ones, both of which rhythms are again nested in tidal, seasonal and astronomical ones. Giorgi Buzaki points out that both action and cognition are based on the brain's ability to generate and sense temporal information. As a cite from Buzaki's book, the te this temporal information is embedded in oscillation that exists at many different times scales. Our creativity, mental experience, says, and motor performance are modulated periodically both at short and long time scales. What emerges is a fractal temporal structure maintain maintained by and generated by nested oscillations, which are sometimes triggered and maintained by external stimuli. At other times they are self-organized, which means the spatiotemporal structure evolves spontaneously in the absence of external influence. Note in uh, parenthesis that I follow Bujaki in using the terms rhythm, oscillation and periodicity interchangeably. They describe the same phenomenon but the individual terms have been adopted by different academ academic disi disciplines. If internal and external rhythms are coupled successfully, the parts of the temporal environment governed by those rhythms can be said to have become incorporated in the observer. The internal rhythms which drive the dynamics of our bodies require frequent recalibration. This becomes necessary whenever we encounter new context or have to adapt to a changing environment. As among others, Van Neuvenhuyse has pointed out successful nesting of internal rhythms into external ones as well as well calibrated internal oscillations are prerequisite for good physical and mental health. Internal rhythms interact both on the same lot when we look for instance at communication among cells and hierarchically, that is to say, between nested levels. And as an example of such hierarchical or vertical nesting is the communication between cells, organs and the entire body and the social environment. As both our bodies and our environment are in constant flux, 
the art of turning those nested rhythms into a harmonious symphony is a, is a constant balancing act. Through nesting internal and external oscillation, we can create a temporally extended observer. Some internal rhythms have become incorporated to such an extent that no external timer is required to maintain this period periodicity. Although in terms of evolution, the internal rhythms have originally evolved by adapting the two external ones. One example is our circadian rhythm, that is to say, our sleep-wake cycle, which no longer requires the external pacemakers of daylight and darkness. When people are exposed to exogenous influences, such as sunlight and social contacts, their circadian rhythms adopts a 24-hour cycle. However, if individuals are deprived of such external pacemakers, their circadian rhythm is shortened by an hour, but levels at around 25 hours. The ability to maintain internal rhythms, which are not perturbed by environmental changes, is a great advantage and therefore a selection effect. Most contextual change, however, requires us to adapt. Clark reports an experiment which provides an impressive example of how living being adjusts to environmental changes by successfully recalibrating their temporal interfaces. A macaque monkey found himself confronted with delay times which were added to or taken away from the course of actions he had learned to perform. The monkey had learned to move a cursor on a computer screen by means of a joystick, while the computer recorded the neural activity which accompanied those actions. Then the joystick stick was disconnected from the computer. The monkey continued his task, still maneuvering the now detached joystick, while he was actually moving the cursor by means of his neural activity. In the next step of the experiment, a robot arm was inserted into the control loop. This mechanical device, which added a slight delay to the cursor steering process because of the mechanical friction it produced, could not be seen by the monkey. The addition of the delay, which the monkey noticed in the visual feedback, that is to say, in the delayed motion of the cursor on the screen, completely confused at the first, but after this it adapted to the new situation and made up for the delay. In other words, the monkey's temporal interface was extended when it compensated the delay by means of anticipatory regulation. That is to say, when it skipped the consecutive interfaces in the control loop, fused them into one, as does the walker when he he incorporates his stick. The monkey never suspected that it moved the robot arm and thus the cursor by thought control alone. This was only clear to the external observers, namely the individuals conducting the experiment. To the monkey, the merge interfaces, neural records, robot arm and cursor were not visibly individually they form one boundary, this is most interesting, to an external observer, by contrast, the couplings of the individual interfaces were visible. The view from the outside allows us to see both the detailed successive interfaces and the one boundary these interfaces have merged into. The examples above show that whenever a new systemic whole comes into being, be it an extended or a reduced version of the original whole, the world observer observer boundary shifts either towards the inside or to the outside.
New systemic holes are formed when conditioning effects make these boundaries invisible to the observer, as is shown in the example of the walking sticks, which is assimilated into an extra limb. An external observer will be able to make out two interfaces, one where the hand touches the handle of the stick, and a second one where the walking stick touches the ground. The view from the inside the systemic hole, Walker plus stick reveals only one interface, which connects the hand directly with the ground. The walker is no longer aware of the now merged interfacial flame. This difference between the outside and outside view is a useful measure of complexity. Hans Fusch, I shall, after Otto Rössler, refer to the inside-outside vantage points as endo and exo perspectives. One way of quantifying and comparing boundaries in terms of their spatial and temporal extensions is to simply count the number of merged interfaces which are no longer visible from within the system, from in, within the systemic hole, but can be made out from the exo perspective. That was the observers mentioned before, who sort of looked at the monkey, but the monkey weren't aware of them. The vantage point of an external observer in compared to the number of interfaces at work from an endo observer's perspective. <clears throat> the difference between the outside and the inside perspective is the number of visible, assimilated or rejected context, which can be measured in delta T depth, that is to say the number of nested interfaces. This relation between delta T depth endo and delta T depth exo I denote as boundary complexity of an embedded endosystem. So in the walking stick example, the exo perspective reveals two interfaces, which emerge into one for the end observer. This is a formula here, where you have delta T depth, and in parenthesis endo equals one, and underneath as a divider you have delta T depth, exo equals two, and that makes a half. 0.5, which gives a value of 0.5 for the boundary complexity. If we speak in terms of temporal nestings, the observer becomes a new extended systemic hole if he successfully couples or assimilates internal and external rhythms, and thus incorporates parts of, this, of his temporal environment. Alternatively, he could also become a new reduced systemic hole, which he assigns parts of himself to his environment. Or suddenly fails to contextualize embedded patterns and react as schizophrenics in Dakin's experiment. If a delay is newly integrated into an observer's sphere of influence, he will adapt through regulatory anticipation and turn into a temporarily extended observer. If an already incorporated delay is shortened or removed from the, his sphere of influence, an observer will adapt through retardation and turn into a temporarily reduced observer. And I have spoken before that modern man is most usually a temporarily reduced observer. And this is because we adapted to this uh, Newtonian simplified time. So it's not so much that the Newtonian model is wrong, it is much to uh, simplification that doesn't suit reality. And I always think to myself, why on God's, in God's name would reality be that simple? as the Newtonian XYZ. I don't know if any one of you have 
actually ponder about that, but think about it. Why on earth should the dimensions and time be that simple? And why shouldn't the observer be more important in sort of understanding objects than just objects, which we know from quantum mechanics will never be understood without an observer. It seems that most people still to this day, they don't train their senses, they don't train their body, bodies in complicated patterns that are inherited since millennia. Too few people do yoga, tai chi, or similar things that are knowledge in the body. We haven't, in, we haven't started to uh, develop those things in the West, but it's about time. But of course, it will take millennia to come to perfection. Knowledge is something in reality. You can't just make knowledge up. This is the idea of metaphysics of presence. This is also the reason why this is sounding uh, at the first take extensionally uh, complicated and I'm sorry for that but it is actually easy in the end because you all had this experience when you were younger and of course the wordings are very complicated but you haven't sort of been in that youthful mood for 20, 30, 40 years so the way of going back will be very complicated and hard in some instances. But as you all remember, it was a fantastic period and it can be uh, achieved once more. You can even go further. You can go as the Asian man, progress your whole life instead of wishing you were young again, which is awfully similar to the metaphysics of presence. Uh, maybe pointed to the good Gothenburg Zendoyo, who metaphysics of presence was all that it was about. This idea of excluding the future and taking away all of past absence was the drug-like in intoxication of a now, and that's so far you can come from anything about Zen or Buddhism. It doesn't, it doesn't get any further. It's like analytic philosophy on LSD. But more about that later. If a delay is newly integrated into an observer sphere of influence, he will adapt through regulatory anticipation and turn into a temporal extended observer. That is fantastic. And this is my memories from youth that I could extend my observance by going into myself. I became externally extended into the real world and I noticed that helped me in doing things, being more effective, being more creative. It was not something solistic, not advances in solipsism, as Bernard de Kostrup's, uh, sort of indicates. This was in true reality. If an already incorporated delay is shortened or removed from this sphere of influence, an observer will adapt through retardation and turn into a temporally reduced observer. Our temporal recalibration can be remarkably persistent, a fact dramatically shown by our distorted perception of events when delays we have adapted to are suddenly removed or shortened. Stetson et al. describe an experiment in which a consistent delay was inserted between the participants pressing of a key and a flash which invariably followed it. After they had adopted to the delay, that is to say, when they had incorporated it, participants were faced with shorter delays. Surprisingly, this made them perceive the flashes as occurring before the pressing of the key, a temporal distortion in which action and perception were reversed because the delay was shorter than the anticipated. Thus, we may deduce that temporal boundary shifts can distort our perception and the temporal order of our nested nows, the big N. But returning to our notion of a personal temporal perspective, can we actually say that a temporal extended observer's now is expanded uh, and that a temporal reduced observer's now has shrunk? 
we can indeed provide the nested interfaces have merged and are no longer visible to the end observer. A fully incorporated layer can no longer be separated from the whole action it is embedded in. Only an exo-observer is able to divide the new systemic whole into its temporal components. The idea is reminiscent of French philosopher Henri Bergson's notion of inter internal duration, durée, as an indivisible whole. This is from the, uh, Henri Bergson. Picture the image of an infinitely small elastic band, contracted, if it were possible, into a mathematical point. We slowly start stretching it so that the point turns into a line which grows continuously. Let us focus our attention not on the line qua line, but on to the action of pulling it. Notice that this action is indivisible, given that it would were an interruption to be inserted become two actions instead of one. This is most interesting, one you pull, and that each of these actions is then the indivisible one in question. When we can then say that it's not the moving action itself, which is ever divisible, but the static line which the action leaves under it as a trail in space. The action of pulling the elastic band is an indivisible hole for the end observer who performs his, this action. The internal duration of this hole is a meaningful entity, which spans the end observers now, incidentally. Bergson also realized that duration requires a nested structure of our now, when he talks about the present as containing a perpetually expanded image of the past. Another quote from Bergson. The internal duration is the continuous life of a recollection which extends into the past, into the present, so that, that, that the present may clearly contain the perpetually expanding image of the past, without this continuing existence of the past in, in the present there would be no duration, only existence of the moment. And I would say that is the metaphysics of presence, the last thing. And that is, if we turn our gaze into the external by neglecting the subjective and don't, and not inferring any knowledge to the subjective, only sitting down and trying to observe what is around us, we will become even more caught in the metaphysics of presence. That is actually the worst thing we can do, bar anything. Nothing can compare to the destruction that we make. I remember now that many people lost their duration, their durée, once they started training as they called meditation. And how that worsened during the years and they became less and less perceptive, sensitive, to time's flight, and they could no longer enter neither into past to future. That was very obvious with the planning function that got more or less uh, petrified, fossilized, atrophied, I think that's the right term. And this, of course, lead to brainal damage in the end, because if the cerebellum is inclined to passivity, passivity is already installed before you start with your mindfulness, meditation, or whatever it is, that will progress exponentially the more you focus on the now or what is. So the cause of the thing is never approached. Therefore, any inclination or direction at looking into reality as it is will make it much worse. Because there is nothing pure with reality as it is. That's the most impure thing that is in Western society. It was affected already by the pre-Socratic and go looking for it resulted in Aristotelian physics, Newtonian physics, and that was only 
uh, sort of broken thanks to quantum physics that made an equal break in the mental sphere first that was very important and then did it in the physical sphere but without getting the knowledge that takes years uh, I hope for, I hope it will be easier in the book that we are making but it will otherwise take years to get into it, it took Emory and I think seven or eight years to get into it then you can practice mindfulness but not before and then you will not then you have the knowledge to bring the subject into this durée and to make it interactive and passivity is no longer something you will achieve because there is an intention when there is an intention and that intention is fostered before you sit down do your mindfulness do your savasana which is the yoga position for mindfulness then you will bring activity into the resting position either if you don't do that you will exponentially add to your passivity you will be more fear to like you will be more fear in you will be more of a passive observer by sitting down lying down or trying to sleep and meditate that somebody suggested no name mentioned well i think it's time to end here i say thank you very much from this lovely valley and i really hope you have a really pleasant afternoon bye bye